Um, today we have Mark McLaughlin, the head football coach at Platteview High School. Coach, how you doing? Doing well. How about you? I'm doing good, Coach. Um, coach is going to talk a little bit about 425 today. Um, but, uh, Coach, I mean, kind of before we get there, for people who don't know you, you want to kind of like talk about yourself so we can kind of figure out like how you got to Platteview? Yeah. Uh, Platteview is a little C1 school, which is the – in Nebraska it goes A is the biggest, B is the second biggest, C1 and C2 – our third and fourth. So we're kind of at the top of C1, bottom of B. We kind of float back and forth. So we're, we're a, a middle-of-the-road-sized 11-man school in Nebraska. Um, and I grew up about 10 miles from where Platteview is uh, and then went to college out in central Nebraska and, and got my first gig out there and landed or stayed there for 12 years. Um, and then as, as the married coaches will know, Eventually, uh, my wife hinted that it was maybe time to go home. So <laughs> Platteview was open and um, put my name in and, and landed that job. And uh, I, we absolutely love it. It's a great place, but um, it's, it's uh, a lot different than my first, my first job out in central Nebraska. The demographics are way different. The resources are, are way different, but... Um, really it, it's, I guess I landed there because it's dead in the middle of, of my hometown and my wife's hometown. Okay. My, I understand that coach. Trust me. I, I, I do. And I think a lot of us do understand where, when, especially the misses. I've talked to a couple other coaches that have kind of moved because, because a spouse wanted to move. I know like, um, who was it? Coach Morrissey moved to our, uh, Arizona for a couple of years because that's where her wife's, his wife's family was. And. So they lived there for a while before coming back up by where his family was. So, like I said, I I understand that, Coach. Um, so Coach, like I said, is going to talk a little bit of four, his four two five and kind of what they do today. Um, I'll I'll pop in with bad jokes or questions as as we go. And and so, Coach, the the floor is yours, sir. Okay. Um, here's my my email address is is on here. If you if you have any questions or whatever, shoot me an email. Uh, I'll be happy to answer to the best I can. Um, I guess I'd, I'd preface this by saying um, just because we do it doesn't mean it would work for someone else. Uh, this this has been a good answer for us um, just based on the clientele that we have. So uh, hopefully it, it fits or at least some piece will fit what some guys are looking for. But a little bit of background, um, I grew up at, at a high school school in, in class B, which is the second largest class. And I played for, I would, I don't even want to say arguably, I don't think an argument can be made against it. The best high school football coach in the state of Nebraska. Um, he's 343 and 94 and he just won his sixth straight, uh, his sixth state title has five runner ups. Uh, but the craziest thing is he's won a state title in four different decades. Um, and, and so playing for him, you know, you think, you know, everything there is to know about football, you, you, you leave that school and, oh yeah, I'm going to take that stuff and we're going to do it at every school I coach at. Well, it helps when you have D one athletes every, every year and, um, unlimited resources essentially. And, and he's obviously a, an incredible coach, but, um, that was, it was really kind of shell shock leaving Elkhorn high and going to my first job. So, uh, I did not play college football. I was a horrible, horrible high school football <laughs> player. Um, so Same I went out coach. to Same central here. Nebraska and coached in a little school called Gibbon, which is, there's only like 80 boys in the entire high school. So not, not very big. Um, and when I was an assistant there for the first three years, we were one in 23. Uh, and our one win was over a team in double overtime that was on a 30 game losing streak. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was rough going from, like I said, going from the best program in the state to one of the, one of the teams that struggles the most in the state was, was pretty rough. And then I took the head job uh, in 2009 and 
we went to the four two five immediately and and in the the ten years that I was there, we went forty five and forty five which you know obviously that's that's right at five hundred um but when you compare that to the one in twenty three that we were prior. I think the the four two five was really the the driving element in that. So, um, and then eventually, my my wife's from around the Omaha area, and I'm Elkhorn's right outside of Omaha. So, we decided it was it was time to come home, and um, landed this job at Platteview High School, which Platteview is about two hundred boys in the high school, nine to twelve. Uh, we're fortunate if we can get 55 to 60 out for football. Um, I think that's the biggest difference between Gibbon and Platteview. In Gibbon, I could get just about all those kids out for football. Uh, there wasn't much special specialization. Platteview has a lot more of that, so that's one of the things we're we're trying to work on. So, um, and then we've used some some of this stuff in, in the Shrine Bowl. I did the Shrine Bowl in 2016, and I'm going to do it again here in 2021. So that's kind of the, my coaching background. But regarding the 425, kind of how we landed on this is what we want to do. Nebraska is primarily a run-first state, and that's, that's really um, – I don't think that's going to change. Even with all the the – modern spread and RPOs and stuff like that. There are more teams in Nebraska that are going to line up in two back and run the ball or line up in one back just to get guys out of the box to run the ball. That's, that's what teams do. Um, yeah, there are teams that'll sling it 50 times a night, but most of the teams on our schedule are run first teams. And uh, we, we see everything from double wing foot to foot splits to five wide uh, jet sweep quarterback draw and or quarterback power or whatever. So knowing that we're going to see a run, we, we just don't like the three front. Um, and I base that off of, I think if you have a three man front, you either need some absolute dudes up there as three as the nose and, and the two DNs, or you better have linebackers that are real, real linebackers that, that are going to get downhill in a hurry right now. And in my 15 years as a, as a football coach, I've only had a handful of what I would call true linebackers where um, we've had some great athletes and, you know, again, I, I don't know what it's like for everybody else, but most of the time here, especially small town, we're, we're going to put our running back or our best athlete. They're going to be the linebacker and it's not because they're a great linebacker. It's because the, they're the best athlete we have. Um, knowing that having the extra defensive lineman in the forefront kind of eases what we need from that kid. So um, there was also a, a big trend in Nebraska. We call it the Bill Callahan trend. He was here as the head coach till like 2007. And as, as you guys all know, football is a copycat game. So Callahan's running all these shifts and, and motions and whatnot pre-snap and at the time, we were we were running an old fifty two monster or a forty four, and we felt like we were stuck. I mean, if teams shifted or or formationed us or motioned, we were in big trouble. So uh, the four two five gave us some flexibility, uh, and it allowed us to to line up against whatever they did pre snap um, or or shift or whatnot without having any alarming errors um we also feel like the the use of our back five allows us to make the front six right no matter what or vice versa so our front six don't change uh, very rarely i mean they might their shade might change but for the most part our front six are lining up in the same spot over and over and over and our back five will handle any formation that that you want to throw at us so 
occasionally there's there's some times we'll move our front six around, but not often. Uh, I think one of the biggest things we liked about the four two five was the requirements for each position have a little bit of flexibility. So we don't ever have to to look at our kids that we have coming back and say, oh man, we, we don't have that that hammer nose tackle. I guess we're going to have to get out. Or, oh, we don't have that downhill linebacker. I guess we're going to have to change. I mean, we feel like we can shift some of the burden of, of those things to other positions and still be okay. So it allows us to say, stay consistent in our schematic teachings um, from for years and years and years and still still get uh, various aspects from, from just different positions. So we, we love that about it. Um, and it also allows us to hide some kids. So like I said, we're, we're running 55 kids or so in our program, nine to 12. Um, this year on defense, we started five sophomores, uh, one senior, four juniors and a freshman, um, or I guess sometimes it was six sophomores and not that freshman, but uh, there are times where it's not like we're recruiting kids and, and filling a defense. We got to play with who we got. And there's times that there's kids that are out on the field that probably aren't ready to be on the field, but they have to be by default. And we, we really believe that we can help that kid. And I, I hate to say hide, but hide that kid in our scheme, just based on what we can ask the other 10 kids to do. So, uh, and then, and then, like I said, 95% of the formations that we see, we can get aligned to and know our assignment without even practicing it. It's, um, we, we do practice all that stuff every day, but if a team comes out and runs something that we haven't seen, that's not, that's nothing for us. It's, it's easy to align to. And I think in high school football, that's, that's a huge part of playing defense is lining up, right? We got some defensive goals every day. Uh, you know, I see you're wearing the old Miss shirt. Yes, we, sir. we went to, uh, we, we went to the old land shark thing that they did a few years ago and our kids try to earn their fins and stuff <laughs> like that. But, um, we have basic goals, yeah. um, like get, get the ball inside the 40 once a game, get our offense, the ball inside the 40, whether it's uh, a, a big punt return, a blocked punt, a fumble recovery, a pick six or a, a pick or whatever. Uh, we want to get a turnover, a half or two in a game either way. Um, the biggest one for us is third down. Um, getting off the field on third down is, I think, one of the more overlooked aspects of defense. Um, you can you can have the best scheme ever, but if you can't execute it on third down, it doesn't matter what you did on first and second. So we really spend a lot of time on third downs. Um, sudden change and and you have some disaster on offense, we got to go play defense right now. And um, you throw a pick and then they score the next play, that that uh, tips the momentum quite a bit. So we want to be 100% there. Um, and then we try to get a three and out, one out of every three series we play on defense, knowing that that's sometimes that's not feasible. I mean, sometimes we're playing teams that it – they could run the same play 50 times in a row and get a first down every time. Uh, they're just better than us. But um, if we can get a, a three and out, one out of every three, we think we're going to win. Um, and then know our alignment and our assignment and execute it every time. So in terms of how we achieve that, uh, there's a ton of pre-snap communication uh, I, I have a, a huddle clip I'll show you in a little bit, but if if you watch our guys before the snap, there's not a lot of like yelling or anything. It's a lot of, of hand gestures. Um, sometimes it's we'll tag stuff as we send it in, but there's they all kind of know what's going on. They do communicate orally, but 
a lot of it is is uh, just a simple hand gesture to somebody that we kind of partner them with in terms of who they're supposed to communicate to. Um, to me as a coach, the biggest one is know the opponent. And I'm almost embarrassed to admit this, but going into a game, I'll have every, every film they have. Uh, I'll probably have their last couple games from the last season. And when we play on Friday night, I'll, I'll have watched a minimum of 25 to 30 hours of film on that team. I'll know every, every formation they run, every play they've run out of that formation, um, whether they motion to a certain formation. Um, just knowing that stuff eases the burden of what we're asking our kids to do, especially when we have some of those kids that, that probably aren't ready to be on the field. So that's kind of a coach thing. Um, and I'll, I'll get to this here in a minute, but sometimes we, we don't give our kids as much information as we have. And the reason is we're trying to avoid what we call paralysis by analysis. So I'll watch 30 hours of film or 25 hours of film and I'll know all the tendencies and whatnot, but we don't necessarily give the kids all of the stuff like that. Just, we don't want to overload them. So uh, we'll give them a scout report and, and basic tendencies and stuff. But really what we ask the kids to understand is what the other team is capable of. And that sounds elementary, but if we're playing a quarterback that we know cannot throw the ball accurately down the field, we need them to know that. If, if we're playing a team that they, they have a fullback that can block, he can catch out of the backfield, he can carry the ball, they need to know that. Um, if, if they are horrible pullers up front, our kids need to know that. So most of our defensive prep is based on the, the skill set that each of their offensive players have. And then our, our alignment and assignment is going to be in a manner that asks those kids or asks the other team to do good at what they're not good at. Um, and then we, we do an, uh, an alignment drill every day at practice to help with, with lining up against stuff. Uh, and then, like I said, you know, playing tendencies down in distance. Uh, this this team is uh, maybe they're in this formation. They run this play 62% of the time. We're lining up to stop that play. So most of what we do on defense is, is very data-driven. Um, but that said, I'm a de degenerate gambler when it comes to <laughs> – to play in teams that we're outmanned against. I mean, if we know we can line up perfect and do our job, they're still going to convert. Then a lot of that data goes out the window and we become pretty, pretty reckless, pretty let's go press, press the issue and see if we can get something. Um, our, our primary goal on defense is make them run as many plays as possible but if they throw it, we're going to make them complete the longest ball, which th those two ideas are kind of opposite. Um, you would think if you're trying to make them run as many plays, you take away the deep ball and make them dink and dunk. Uh, I think high school quarterbacks and, and high school passing games have evolved enough. If you give a kid a five-yard stick route, he'll complete it 90% of the time. So – we're not given that anymore. If you give a kid a 25 yard post corner route, I don't think they're going to complete that as, as much as they're going to complete the stick. So we, in the run game, we, we try to make that as, as hectic and as congested as possible. Um, but in the past game, we are essentially going to dare you to beat us from 25 yards or more. Um, and then, like I said, uh, avoid a paralysis by analysis. So to me, the, the number one thing that we do that 
that I think at most defenses do this, but the, this you, your alignment and your assignment, I think, have to be married to each other. And um, I, when I first got into the four two five, I I was really big into doing what Rick Stewart does, which I'm sure many people know him. He had a four two five gang green series that he put out and uh he he was very much into the alignment doesn't change your assignment and um i think that that for him that that works for us that doesn't work uh we can't ask uh, a d end to line up as a seven tech inside the tight end but still be contained it 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 doesn't We've, we've aligned that kid to get blocked down already. Um, so we don't do that. We, wherever they align, that's their assignment, unless we called some stunt or twist or something like that. And the same in the secondary. We're, it, we're not going to try to fool many teams with where we're putting guys. And that's, that's mostly based on the type of player that we have um, so instead, we use a lot of coverage calls, and every now and then we'll shift the box, but we try to kind of avoid that. But most of the time, or not most of the time, every time, we're going to eliminate run past conflict, especially for our roll-down safeties and linebackers. Uh, I don't think you can ask a Mike linebacker to, to be an A-gap run player, but also a flat pass player. Those, those don't line up. Um, and we have eliminating those has allowed our kids to, to play with a lot more confidence. So uh, I don't know that you really need to see that. That's kind of our basic practice schedule for a defensive day. Um, do a lot of short increments of stuff. Um, again, our kids are playing both ways. So we kind of do a lot of offensive stuff on Tuesday and a lot of defensive stuff on Wednesday. We'll do team O and team D on both days, but in terms of like individual stuff, most of it is Wednesday for defense and on offense. Uh, most of that's on Tuesday. Hey coach, how long is your film session yeah. inside before practice for pre-practice? Uh, okay. So film, we, We'll bring the kids in on Monday. Uh, we play JV games on Monday. Okay. So most of our team is gone. I mean, we'll send 30 kids to a JV game. We spend a ton of time on Monday, like an hour or hour and a half on Monday, going through our film um, from the previous game, the other team's film, the scouting report, so we'll we'll get kind of the nuts and bolts of our film done on Monday. Tuesday, we don't bring the kids in to watch film at all. They're, they get done with school and we go straight out to practice. Tuesday is kind of our long day in terms of time on the field. Wednesday, uh, what we have, especially during COVID, we had to uh, limit the number of kids that were in the locker room at once. So one group would come down to my room and we're watching 15 minutes of film. Another group would go out to the field and get all the tackling dummies and all that junk drug out to the field. And another group would be in the locker room. And then when the 15 minutes was up, the group that was in the locker room would go start like pre-practice drills. The group that was dragging bags around would go to the locker room or would come watch film with me. And the group that was watching film with me and go to the locker room. So Wednesday we'll get like, depending on the kids, uh, D linemen maybe would get 15 minutes of film. DBs would get like 20 to 30. And then we go out and practice. Um, but most of that, most of our film stuff isn't really outside of a COVID year. We don't do that. We do all the film before school. Um, like they'll come in at like seven o'clock in the morning and, uh, I'll give you kind of an example of we're, we're somewhat pressed for time in terms of practice. So we try to, to maximize the, the time that we do have with the kids. And 
like when they come in on Wednesday morning, here's the team. These guys were the state champs prior. Okay, so I'm going to make make huddle playlists essentially with, all right, this is their two-back pistol stuff. When Wahoo was in two-back and it was a pistol, this is what they ran. Okay. And it's all based on tendencies. They ran a, a ton of pistol veer. So <laughs> there was the first play, pistol veer. Next time they were in two back pistol, it's wait for it, pistol veer. Now, did they run veer any other formation? No. Did they run pistol any other formation? No. So showing that to our kids without them having to watch an entire film saves them a lot of time. Um, it gives them a good idea what to expect when they see that. Same thing with. We call this formation single. When they got lined up in this formation, they ran a, a little inside reverse a lot. Um, so we make these little playlists, and then uh, Wednesday morning when they come in, that's what we show them. And we share it with them and stuff like that, so they obviously have access to it prior to Wednesday, but walking them through this stuff is good. I mean, a lot of a lot of our film stuff is pretty. We we show them what we want them to see, if that makes sense. And I I think it's it kind of makes it a little bit more efficient for us. Um, I, I, we use the term. We think there's a difference between watching the game and watching the film, and a lot of our kids. When they get home on Friday night, they they go watch the game. They oh hey, that was when you laid that kid out. That that's not watching film. That's that's watching the game. Uh, Wednesday morning, we watch film, and it's it's studious and it, that that has seemed to help us quite a bit. So, uh, those are just basic drills that we do. Um, so in t- terms of alignment and assignment. Uh, all of our, all 11 of our defensive positions have a pretty simple, um, name. The the nose, we, we call them the N, the DT, the three tech, we call a T. Both of our ends are interchangeable. Um, they're both just ends. And then we play with a mic and a will. So most of the time our nose tackle, we're going to play a kid that's probably not, um, your standard D tackle. He's he's probably somewhat undersized, uh, but he's a fast twitch type kid. So, like, there's been years we've played our running back as the nose tackle. There's been years we've played a tight end as a nose tackle. Um, but what we want from him is is just to be somewhat um, disruptive but he has to also be under control. So he's a penetrator. Uh, He won't take on blocks. His job is to penetrate through the line of scrimmage. We tell him to get ankle deep on the, whoever he lined up on, get ankle deep on that guy and then redirect. Our D tackle is a block eater. uh, And he's usually a three tech to the strength, um, but we do sometimes run him the other way. Uh, and then our our ends are they're either going to be uh, outside the tackle or we'll line them up as a seven tech inside a tight end. Um, and then our our Mike and and our Will are the two linebackers. Will since Will is playing on top of our nose, we try to put our best reader there in terms of linebackers. Not necessarily our more athletic of the two, but. Uh, with our nose tackle not helping him, our nose tackle's getting, he's not taking any blocks. That means Will's got to read a little bit faster than Mike does because uh, the, the lineman that Mike lines up over is, is going to get engaged with our D tackle. Um, and then in the back five, we call him a buck, a joker, and a peso. Uh, and then we play with the boundary corner and a field corner. So our is kind of our first roll down safety. He's, he's at times he's an outside linebacker. 
Um, our joker usually goes to the number two receiver, especially if he's detached. And then our peso uh, will replace our buck or whoever rolled down into the box. He's going to replace him in coverage. Um, all three of those guys are what we call alley runners. Um, our interior six are trying to spill every run play to the perimeter. And Buck, Joker, and Peso are going to make a ton of tackles in the alley. And what we call the alley is about from the hash marks to the top of the numbers. So we, we get everything in that general area. And our corner will set kind of a secondary contain at the numbers. Um, and then, like I said, our front six is going to spill things outside the hash mark. And we kind of a vice from those two things and then our buck joker and peso are going to run that alley um and then our our boundary corner is who we think is our best cover corner guy and the reason we put him in the boundary is most teams are going to go three by one to the field or or they're going to go their best wide receivers um or their their more wide receivers to the field um We'll put our best cover guy into the boundary and play man to man all day. Uh, that way we can we can help to the the heavier pass numbers. And then our field corner, he's going to the wide side. He's he's your typical corner, not a great physical kid, just a good athlete. Cover he'll have some help in coverage, but uh, definitely not our our best of the two. So front six, um, we, we play base 95% of the time. Um, and I call it in like this base. Uh, sometimes we'll go into a stack where one of our DNs will drop out to a linebacker and then we can get into a 33 or we can go crush where we'll bring our mic down. And instead of a 42, it's a 51. So we have the ability to change our front. Last year, I think we did that one time. We just we play a four two five and we like it. We don't want to we don't want to get out of it unless it's you know third and inches or fourth and inches. So base alignment. Um, this is this is against a, a typical set we see with a tight end and a and a split to this side and then a slot to this side. Um, we're going to play this outside shade on the tackle and then a one tech here, three tech and an inside shade on the tight end. Now, because here's our general rules. We, our base alignment is set to handle five down linemen, a quarterback and a running back. Our front four plus our two linebackers, those six guys are going to line up the, the exact same against five down quarterback running back. If they add a guy to the box, we're going to add a guy to the box. So in this case, they added a tight end. Um, he's here. We're not going to change our D end. Instead of being, you know, outside shade of the tackle, we're going to just slide him out to inside shade of the tight end. And the reason we do that is because this guy right here, our buck, is going to read off what he does. And we think it's easier for him to read the tight end when the tight end's covered. So they added this tight end. We're going to add our buck. So we've still got our, our numbers. It's still seven on seven in the box. Okay, they got their six linemen plus whichever of these two is not going to get the ball. So it's seven on seven. Okay, now this buck knows when he comes down into the box – He's got to read the tight end. If the tight end is the down block or the tight end is a pull, he's coming right now. He doesn't care about pass because he's covered. He's shielded with the peso over top. Um, our general rule, again, once you come into the box, you're a run first player and you don't care about pass. So the only time Buck would care about pass is if the tight end released right away. If he were to, to show pass and vertical release or get out to the flats right away, our buck could go with him. 
if he gives any resemblance of a run action, our buck is now a full on run player and peso will handle this kid in play action. Um, now I, every time we go through this stuff and I talk to like college DCs or other defensive guys, Oh man, coach, you're only playing two on two to the, to the field. Yeah, we are. And the reason we're, we're playing two on two palms coverage has been the great equalizer for us. If they want to run something fast to the flats, our corner is going to destroy it. If, and like I said at the beginning, we want to make you complete the longest throw. So if you want to try to hit the whole shot where you run like bubble and a, and a fly right here from number one, that's fine. You can try to throw that before our joker gets over. But we get good run support. We get good flats coverage from here. And then in this area right here, Will can help on slant and – and we cheat him a lot. So instead of lining him up on the guard, we're going to line him up on the tackle, but inside shade. So if you were to look at gaps, we're still sound. We're outside B gap, A gap, B gap, A gap, C gap, D gap. We still got all the gaps covered. We just cheat Will uh, so that he on back out of the backfield or quick slant or stick He's going to work to get underneath of that and pass. He's going to kill anything in the flats out here, and he's going to carry the vertical. Um, the thing that with palms, and I don't know how familiar people are with palms, but and I guess that's that's a whole other topic. Palms, two read, blue, whatever you want to call it. We call it palms. Uh, or sometimes we call it robber. It just depends on what our kids want. But his rule right here is anything fast to the flats from number two is his. Um, and if this kid's fast to the flats, he's got number one and it's done. But if they were both to release vertical, fine. We'll play nine on nine from here over. So again, moving this guy down into the box and I go back to what I said about run pass conflict when we put this buck down here as an outside edge player, we don't want him to have to worry about playing edge run and then also worrying about the tight end getting out in the flats because those don't line up. You've got kids in conflict there. So once he comes down, his, his run response or his pass responsibility no longer exists, and our peso is going to take care of that. Uh, I probably drew the peso a little too deep here. He would line up a little bit tighter, but you get the idea. Um, when we line up, all those guys have a communication assignment. So our DNs are going to call out the number of tight ends or wings that they have to their side. And the reason they do that is so that this buck knows I got to get down in the box. This kid says zero, zero, zero. Is his joker. These two are kind of attached, and these two are kind of attached. When this kid says zero, he knows he can get out without worrying about getting into the box. He says one, one, one. This kid knows he's got to come down. Uh, the D tackle calls out the down and distance to the front six, but he does that between plays. You'd be stunned how many kids have no clue what down it is. It's like I don't really understand how you can lose track of that, but they do. Um, or it's third down and four, and, and people are stunned that they went on two. So we we have him call that out. Uh, our nose tackle doesn't really have a job. And then Mike and Will call the run strength. And, and then sometimes we look at the running back set. And like in this case, our Mike is calling this Lucy. And our will is calling it plus because he is offset to the run strength. If he were to offset this way, we're going to call that minus. Um, and that's more, uh, the plus and minus is more for running back out of the backfield. Uh, who's going to pick him up. So we play, I would say 95% a form of man to man coverage uh, and I count Palms as man-to-man. -man. I, I think Palms is just a matchup zone, um, but we, we play it like man. So 
Um, and then those, I mean, that's our basic gaps. But D line techniques, I think I wish there was a standard D line technique. We don't get into like the two eye and stuff like that. For our kids, it's easy for us to say a zero is here, and then every player on that they can have up front is worth three. One is inside, two is on top, three is outside. And that's how we call it. So we're a standard three and one. Uh, usually we would play a seven on the tight end and then a six on the tackle. Um, those guys will get set based on Mike's run call. But we, we call the run strength. Um, usually by default, we're going to call it to the tight end. But when we scout, we might change it. Like if they're a huge uh, team that runs to the field, we'll call it to the field the whole game. Um, if they're certain formations, they run to this gap, we're going to call the strength in a manner that puts us in that gap. So um, the one exception for us is, is trips. We always call the run strength away from trips, and I'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, that just helps us in pass coverage. It, it helps us with eliminating run pass conflict and alignment and assignment. But uh, again, like for, here's, here's a good example of when we would, instead of calling our strength to the tight end, we called it to the split here. And this is one of those examples where like previously this formation, I had us in palms over here, peso and buck over here. If this combination has given us some problems, then we're going to adjust how we play that where we can get our peso over there. Uh, but in order to do that, since our peso used to be over here, we want him over here. We need to get someone else over here. And in order to do that, we're going to shift our line away so we call the strength to the split which helps our will get on top of him now and now our peso can move over and play on top of the two receivers so again all of all of our alignments are our back five will make our front six right or vice versa uh without losing some spot on the field against a tight, you know, that's our base, I guess. Like they added a guy, we added a guy. They add another guy, a fullback. So our buck's going to come down too. Um, we always try to avoid being outnumbered in the box with the exception of it's third down and 18. We don't really care how many guys you have in the box. We're, we're still going to play a light box there. But uh, these guys, I don't, I mean, these are just various so sometimes if we get a two back team, we'll, we'll call the strength to the set, uh, not caring about the tight end. We think the fullbacks more, uh, meaningful. So we call it over there instead. So, um, <clears throat> all of our D linemen are, are half a man guys ex with the exception of the nose tackle. So we don't, we don't necessarily like play a gap. We play half a man, and wherever that half side goes, that's where our DT goes or our DN goes. Um, inside zone or, or any sort of a read play on our D end, if the tackle tries to climb, our, our D, D end is going to slide down and shrink that gap, um, which fits because we, we actually hope the quarterback pulls it because if the quarterback pulls it, he's running to the alley. And that's where we want everything to go. We don't want the running back running A gap or B gap. So we are we like that. Um, I guess when I started uh, 15 years ago, it was kind of an unwritten rule that the DNs are contained. And if, they, if a, a run play ever got outside, you heard – you know, Johnny genius from the stands shouting at his, at the DNs to contain, you guys got to contain. But that's, that's not what we do. We, our DNs are not contained players. Um, we don't necessarily have contained players and that's, that's more in our effort to spill everything. 
but we have outside leverage. I mean, we our buck, for instance, when he comes down, would technically be contained, but we're not really trying to contain things inside the box. We're trying to contain things to where our alley runners are. Uh, slants and stuff, or you know, we we do that stuff, but again, we don't we don't like to slant. We don't like to stunt because if you do that, you can't play the half a man. If you're if you're a three tech and I slant you, you're not playing anything. I've dictated where you're going and. Uh, I, I just don't, unless I know what play's coming, I'm not going to slant or stunt. Uh, now, like I said before, I'm a degenerate gambler. So <laughs> if, if we're playing a team that's way better than us, yeah, we're going to slant and stunt because that's our only hope. We, we have to do something. But most of the time, we don't, we don't mess with that stuff. Uh, we do stunt on pass downs. And we, we tell our kids all the time up front, you guys earn the right to rush the passer. You play your, your half a man on first and second down, then we'll slant and stunt or whatever you want on third down and turn you loose. Um, all of our slants and stunts, stunts especially, are, are named Nebraska. Well, N for nose tackle, E for end. So our Nebraska stunt is the nose tackle and his end. Our Texas stunt is the D tackle, who we call T and the end. Montana is the Mike linebacker and the DT, um, MT. Uh, Wyoming is the Will linebacker and the nose. Um, that works for us because it's easy for our kids to remember and it takes one word. Uh, at one point, we messed with those picture boards like Oregon has with the, you know, four yeah. pictures and had a corn husker and a longhorn and a Montana grizzly and a Wyoming cowboy. It, we're not very cute, man. We just <laughs> like, well, how do you call your defense? You know how I call our defense? I yell it out onto the field, Texas. And we really don't care if the other team knows it. That works for us. So uh countries are our linebackers and dns so mexico is mike and end uh fun fact there's not one country in the entire world that starts with w <laughs> yeah i looked <laughs> so we had to call our will stunt canada uh, um, that's funny yeah i looked everywhere but and then our, our general rule for stunts is whoever's going inside goes first and whoever's going outside goes last. And that's primarily because we don't want to lose contain on a pass play. Uh, that's about the one time I care about keeping things in the pocket. Um, linebackers run first, guys. So, uh, I mean, our linebackers don't do anything special. Um now, I guess in terms of alignment and assignment, I think option is is one one thing, and and there's a million different types of option. There's pistol veer, like we saw from Wahoo. There's inside zone, which is a simple two man read option. Power read, inverted veer, uh, old school triple option. Um, our rather than tell our kids. You have dive, you have quarterback, you have pitch, or you have inside, you have outside. We don't assign anything. Um, and the reason we don't assign anything is we feel like good option teams can change up their blocking scheme to get your whoever you had on dive, they can block him. Mm -hmm. If whoever you had on quarterback, they can block him. So we don't we don't assign that stuff. We we play it. What did what did your read take you to? Uh, and I, I have a little cut up. I'll show you. We our general rule for option. This is when I was at Gibbons. So we're in blue and black. But our general rule here is like, like our D end right here. He's inside that tight end. If this guy goes down. He's going to take the dive or whatever comes to him first. He's going to follow that man down and whatever option it is. 
If it's the dive back, he's taking it. If it's the quarterback, he's taking it. He's a guard reader. So if he reads this guard tackle double, he's going to scrape over top of that and, and play whatever is first. He's not going to worry about the dive coming down because he knows since this guy came down right here, our D end is stepping there. So he's going to take this. If that's the quarterback, so be it. If it's the running back, so be it. These guys, uh, again, they added a tight end. You can't really see him, but here's our buck. He's going to play off the tight end. If the tight end is down, he's going to come up and play the first option. This guy is our alley runner. That's the peso. So knowing that he's coming down, he's going to go out. Um, we don't always execute it perfectly, but like this is an old school dive option. So there it is. There's the down block. That means he is going to come here and take this, and he should be going over the top. Now, he gets caught up in the block. So that goes back to what I was saying before. Rather than tell this guy, you have to take this player or you have to take this player, if we would have told him you have quarterback, well, he just got blocked. So now who has quarterback? Nobody. Uh Rather than do that, you're going to see 44 or three is going to have to go play that quarterback, which is fine. We, we got exactly what we wanted. It's strung out to the sideline. They got a two yard gain. Uh, here it is again. Now, superhero D end right here wants to be an all American. That's a pretty clear down block right there from 79. He should have come down and sat and played the dive. Well, he thinks he can play both. So he looks at it, leaves it. Now he's going to go play the quarterback. Meanwhile, our buck out here did what he should have done. He got a down block right here. He assumed this guy would take dive. He's going to take next man. So he came to play quarterback. Not pitch. Oh, you're going to see the DN. What are you doing, man? Come on. Well, you're the one who screwed up. Not him, not the, not the pitch or whatever. Now the next, the next series, they run the same thing and we get it right. There's dive, there's pitch strung out to the sideline. They're going to run it this way. DN takes dive, slow play. We slow play everything after the dive. So you'll see he's just going to sit and wait. It was quarterback. Quarterback made an early work for a seat here. That's a different team. But again, if we were to say DNs, you have to take dive. Well, tell me how the DN is going to take this dive right here. I, he can't. He's blocked. I mean, there, there's no pitch, man, but that's still option. The quarterback can pull it. So, again, we, we play our reads. And whatever, whatever option the read takes you to, that's what you play. Another one's same, same type of idea. It's dive option. We see a ton of dive option. That's worked really well for us, though. Um, and I, I don't see us ever going back to the old school. You have to take this guy. You have to take this guy. And I'm not saying that's wrong. That, yeah. that works for some people. That doesn't, that doesn't work for us. And the reason it doesn't work for us is it changes. It, it puts us in that conflict that we try to avoid, where we try to give our kids a one man read and based on what that one kid does, you go here, wherever, whatever man that puts you on fine. Um, unbalanced. We don't really do anything different with, we treat the center of their line. Like he's the center. So in this situation, we would set a one tech to their guard 
So our one tech would actually be on their tackle and our three tech would actually be on the center. But I mean, again, I don't know that there's a right or wrong way to do it. That's just easiest for us in terms of alignment. Now in the back five, uh, the, I think the back five is really what makes it go because those guys can fix anything that the front six do. And uh, they're past first players, but they run the alley and we, we can help them. We can help the front six. We can get more guys into the box based on coverages. And we have a lot of coverages. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of a believer that cover one is the most worthless coverage there is <laughs> unless you have, I mean, you better have an absolute dude playing safety that can go sideline to sideline. Uh, so we don't, we barely ever play cover one. Uh, if we play cover one, we play what we call roll one where we just line them up over top of their best dude and we double team their best dude. So you, bra- not- you essentially just bracket them at that point. Yeah. Okay. And but exactly. We bracket him and we, we don't disguise it. Like I, I honestly think teams that play cover one are playing with 10 guys because that safety that's standing in center field. I mean, he's not, unless he's a really good D one D two type football player. Yeah. I don't know what you're getting out of him. So we'd, we'd rather just play zero and get an extra guy in the box or play cover two or quarters or something. Again, I'm a degenerate gambler. So we're, we like to blitz a lot and play with our guys on an island, but we don't necessarily feel like they're on an island because we feel like Palms kind of neutralizes that. It gives them a little bit of safety help. Um, they, they take the easiest route. I mean, that that's easy. Uh, again, like there, that's what, that's what we would do. Roll yeah. one rather than put this guy here, we're going to put him all the way out there and we don't really care if you know. So, I mean, those are all basic coverages. I think guys know now I think trips is a different animal. So like when we call our play in, we might call base, Texas, cover two, solo. Base is the front. Texas is the stunt. Cover two is what we're going to play against any formation except trips. And then solo is what we're going to play against trips. So we call two coverages on every play. If they come out in trips, um, we're going to play solo. And again, I'm in love with palms. So we try to play palms against anything we possibly can. Solo is our palms. One guy goes solo man to man and the other two play palms. How do you, how do you line up against empty? Like, okay. Empty is empty is the one that breaks our rules. I got to go find it. So, uh, I, I said in here, uh, 95%. 95% of the time, we're not budging in our 42 box. Empty, if it's three by two empty, and I'll I'll show these on a diagram. If it's three by two empty, we're still playing a 42 box. We're we're not, I mean, we'll shift our will a little bit, but uh, four by one empty is the one that is a pain in the ass for us. Uh, But we don't don't see that much. Um, I'll kind of show you... Okay. If we uh, if we were to see three by one, let's say. Okay, so let's say they're here. We're gonna go outside shade, outside shade. Now, I like to do this a lot, especially against trips. This is one of those situations where I think you can help your linebackers. We play inside shades with our noses or with our tackles because alignment wise, that allows our linebackers to get further out. That makes sense. Yeah. Their their gap is still the same, but we can cheat them in terms of alignment. So these guys take care of the A gaps. These guys have B gaps by rule, but we cheat them at times, like all the way out. Sometimes we'll put them, 
outside shade of the ta- of the the tackles, and they're still reading guard. If the guard down blocks, yeah. they're coming, but it gets them out here in coverage already. Um, over here, we're going to play our palms rules. We're going to put our corner down and our joker up, and we're going to ask this kid, Will, to help us on slant and stick. Uh, he's going to eat up any bubble, any arrow, any quick out, anything fast to the flats is going here, and then he's going to carry the vertical. So this would be our corner and our joker. Over here, we're going to put our buck down as the flat guy. We're going to play our peso there and our corner there. And these guys are going to be palms on him. And this is going to be that what we call solo. So he's going man to man. Now, we also play kind of a converted solo and i'll show you that quick i got a i got a a cut up of that where to be honest with you we don't even have a name for it it's uh we kind of refer to it as cleanup um it's a version of palms but it's not it's not palms so we play this lot against empty especially the trip side of empty you're going to see it over here on the right side of the screen so there, here's their trips okay and we're lined up in that palms look these two guys are going to handle those two and he's going to handle him man to man if this guy goes to the flats he leaves and this guy becomes the read in palms. Does that make sense? Yeah. So instead of playing fast to the flats on number two, they pass him, and our corner is going to squat on number three, even though he wasn't originally part of it. Um, we get a pick right here. So there he goes, fast to the flats. Number two went vertical. I'm sorry, number one went vertical. And then our our man that originally lined up on number three, he's that what I call cleanup. He's got to figure out what's left and go match it. Um, and we're, we're, we've gotten to be pretty good at that, especially when, like, he gets a pick off that one, which that's pretty easy, especially when we can get help underneath from Will that allows this kid to kind of sink off a little bit and uh, in empty, like I was drawing up before, uh, moving those D tackles inside gets that will line, uh, will linebacker lined up a little bit wider. So we, that's, that's like the number one reason we do it is it it allows us to play a, a bracket of some sort. Now, if we get a four by one, which we do, and, you know, honestly, the, the, the biggest pain four by one is if they give us a tight end, like Trey open like that, plus one, that gives us major amounts of trouble because our alignment rules say outside one, three, seven, they added a guy, so buck, corner, corner joker over number two peso over top here mike will that's our alignment rules well we've got a seven man box and nobody over number three so what we usually do is detach our buck and we play these guys in that that uh clean up coverage that i was just showing you we'll play our pesto um down where the buck was and we'll have Will carry him vertical or vice versa. We'll have Peso stay high and put Will out there. So those two guys kind of take care of the tight end. These three guys take care out here. And then that bad gambling habit I have, corners <laughs> all alone on an island over here. Yeah. Uh, if it's If it's any form of like 
standard two by two, we go back to our poems rules. These guys, um, these guys right here are going to play poems on him. Those two right there. These two guys are going to play poems right here. Okay. I like that. We, coach. we treat them uh, the same, essentially. And then in this case, we would shift some help. So we would get, uh, and occasionally we do this, where we'll play these guys inside again so that we can cheat our linebackers. Here, where it's one-on-one, -on -one, we'll put the D end inside of the tackle and get this guy way out here. He's our That's our Will or Mike linebacker. He's reading tackle. Tackle's a down blocker or something. Then he knows he's got to get involved. If tackle pass sets, he's getting underneath. And corner's playing over top, so we get the bracket-type coverage on the single side. Um, but we like that because... It, based on the simple read right here. I mean, there's no way to play action to. So high hat, get to the flats. If if it's not high hat, you got to fold in and get ready to play in the run game. Yeah. All right, Coach. No, that's great. No, like, that's perfect. And I, like I said, I like that quads adjustment right there. Just play double palms. So, um, coaches, if you want to get hold of – uh, Mark the Gambler uh, McLaughlin here. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, his contact information will be in the bio for you. How to get a hold of him. He's also pulling it back up on the screen, I believe. Um, but please give him a reach out. Uh, his email will be down there. It's easy copy and paste for you guys. Uh, along with his Twitter handle. Give him a follow. Uh, and don't forget to like and subscribe this video and any other videos you watch. It's helpful for... Uh, so co other coaches and can find it on YouTube with all their search filters and all that lovely jazz helps the channel grow. And uh, that way we can keep doing this kind of stuff. Um, coach, I appreciate you coming on. Um, and I, well, I hope you, I hope you have a good, tw if we don't speak again before your next season, good 2021. And um, if not, at least I'd, I remember you mentioned you're what, doing the Shrine, uh, Nebraska Shrine game this year, I believe. Um, so good luck with that as well. Um, thanks coach. Appreciate you having me on. Thank you.